When the Law Society of Upper Canada decided to sponsor a one-day workshop on basic problems in evidence, the response was somewhat larger than was anticipated, and the program was therefore subsequently repeated. The workshops took the form of a lecture followed by a panel discussion in each of the morning and afternoon sessions. The panel discussions were, however, a little out of the ordinary. They consisted of a number of short TV scenarios, each of them followed by a panel discussion examining the various evidentiary problems that arose. In the second workshop, the panels were switched around a little so as to give some variety in opposing views. Both sessions were recorded on videotape, and these programs are an edited version of the discussions of the evidentiary problems arising from the simulated courtroom scenarios. I do not think you will find many clear-cut answers to these fairly common problems. What you will find are discussions of some basic but extremely important principles from which solutions are suggested. This program is designed primarily for the legal profession, though we hope that others will be interested and will perhaps gain some insight into the workings of this aspect of the legal system and the way in which the law tries to reconcile conflicting interests. For the lawyers in particular, citations and references will be given for cases and materials mentioned should they wish to make a note of them. There were in total four panels of which two each discussed separately half of the fact situations. On the first day, chairing panel number one was the Honourable Mr. Justice Edson Haynes of the Supreme Court of Ontario. With him appeared Mr. William Poole QC, practising in London, Ontario, and a member of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, and Professor Hugh Silverman QC, a practitioner of many years standing, and now Professor of Law at the University of Windsor. Chairing panel number two was the Honourable Mr. Justice Thomas Zuber, of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and with him were Mr. Clay Powell QC, counsel in the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario, and Professor Desmond Morton QC, who is both a practitioner and a law professor at the University of Toronto. Mr. Justice Zuber also chaired the first panel on the second day's program, and appearing with him on that occasion were Mr. Justice Frank Weatherston, of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and again, Professor Hugh Silverman. Mr. Justice Haynes chaired the last panel, again with Mr. Clay Powell and Professor Morton as the panelists. As a result of the editing, panel discussions do not always appear in the order in which they were presented. The first scenario you will see illustrates some of the problems that arise in cases of rape because of the doctrine of recent complaint. You will hear discussed both the tactical and ethical issues involved if there is a complaint, but it is not recent enough to be admitted in evidence. And you will, incidentally, hear observations on the difficulties and perhaps unfairness that occur in prosecutions for sexual offenses against females where, indeed, the search for consistency may sometimes seem to reach a level beyond that of common sense. Yet, however much we may want to protect the rape victim, we cannot ignore the rights of the accused and the dangers of a false accusation. Virginia Sweet, 18, who lived with her parents, charged the accused with rape. Virginia had gone out twice to be accused and didn't mention the rape until the next day at work when someone asked her, what's new? The trial judge ruled that her complaint was not made at the first reasonable opportunity and excluded the evidence. The issue is whether or not she consented to it. Now, in deciding whether or not she consented to it, I ask you to bear one thing in mind. She did not complain to anyone immediately after it took place, and I suggest to you that the fact that she did not complain is more consistent with her consenting than it is with her not consenting to the intercourse. My Lord, I really must object. What my friend is doing is quite improper.
How many noticed that departure? Did you notice that Bob Carter said, did not complain immediately, whereas the script says, she did not complain about the rape? And that's going to highlight some of our discussions. And that perhaps for departing from the lines, we're indebted to Bob Carter for having done so. Now, the thrust of this particular problem is Carter saying, and we'll take the script. <laughs> we'll take the script first. <laughs> the thrust is she did not complain about the rape, whereas she did complain, but the judge found it inadmissible. Now, the problems that we're going to start off with by asking Bill Poole to talk about, is there an ethical problem as far as counsel is concerned? And saying this to the jury when in fact she did complain. And secondly, is an, is an inadmissible complaint no complaint? Take it from there, will you, Mr. Poole? Well, Mr. Chairman, I... Uh, your sign? Get, get it going. I think it's all right. Is that all right? I'm uh, a little bit nervous. I hold myself out as no authority on rape, <laughs> particularly since uh, Mr. McKinnon uh, suggested that the class of 48 were in the room. I would think that they uh, know a hell of a lot more about the subject than I. <laughs> <clears throat> possibly have had more experience and should be in my position right now. But commenting on the videotape, I think that the trial judge was right in rejecting the evidence of the complaint because if I might remind you, to be admissible, the complaint must be made immediately after the event or at the first reasonable opportunity, and it must not be made in response to leading questions. And the basis in the, uh, for those rules, if they can be called rules, are to be found in the common law when a girl who was ravaged was expected as her duty to raise a hue and cry to alarm the neighborhood of the fiend which they nurtured in their breast. <laughs> now the purpose as evidence of a complaint in my judgment is that it's not admissible as corroboration of the facts. It's not admissible as evidence of the facts. It's not hearsay evidence, nor does it come within the hearsay rule, because it's not admissible as truth of the facts contained in the statement. But it is admissible to establish that the victim's conduct was consistent with her evidence in the box, and also to negative the idea of consent. Here, the counsel for the accused said she did not complain, when in fact she did complain, but the complaint was not admissible because it wasn't of a recent nature. Here, there is no evidence in the courtroom of complaint, and it's Counsel's duty, as you know, and as every judge instructs the jury, you must render your decision only on the evidence that you hear in the courtroom. So it might be splitting hairs to say that the counsel for the accused, when he said that there was no complaint, is really in effect the same as saying there was no evidence of complaint. I don't hold that view. I think the counsel in this case was wrong. I think he was unethical. And if I was counsel for the Crown, 
I would interrupt his jury address and complain. Now, imagine, imagine this situation. Supposing, for example, that there was a statement given by the accused in a case and the crown head of voir dire found that, and the judge admitted the statement, then the crown decided not to use it. How could the crown counsel then go to the jury and say to them, holding it in his hand even, wouldn't you think that the accused would be expected to, to give a statement in these circumstances, and I can tell you as Crown Counsel, there's no evidence of a statement. Well, that's pretty much the same problem here, and the situation that I referred to was the 1970 case of Regina versus Hodd, which I think was wrong, in the British Columbia Court of Appeal. So my, to sum up, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I don't think that the counsel for the accused is correct, nor do I think he's ethical when he says there is no complaint. What he should be talking about is there is no evidence of a complaint in these circumstances. Boy, you're spitting. <laughs> and you're saying he's unethical. What about the videotape as we saw it, in which he introduced the words, no immediate complaint? Uh, regardless of whether it's the script we're using or it is the videotape, do you agree that he ought not to have said it? I don't think he should have said it at all. Now, uh, there was a 19... Oh, there was a case in the Ontario Court of Appeal many years ago, about 1924, Regina, Rex versus Hall. It's recorded in uh, uh, 49 Canadian criminal cases. And the Chief Justice at that time, I believe, said that where issue is in dispute, it's a serious misdirection for the trial judge to charge the jury to disregard the fact that there is no complaint. The trial judge must charge them. So that here, the trial judge would have to charge the jury, but he'd have to tell them that there is no evidence of complaint because to put it in a nutshell, what the, def what the defense counsel here is saying is simply not the truth. Well, all right, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for a moment and go to Professor Silverman. What should the trial judge do in this situation? Well, I'd just like to take uh, issue, if I may, uh, with Bill Poole. I know that's taking on quite an adversary. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, saying that this is unethical. Well, let, we all know that we play a, a game here. Certain rules, rules of evidence, rules of practice, and so on. And while uh, there is no evidence of a complaint before the court, when counsel says that there's no complaint, isn't he really playing according to the rules of the game? He's saying, he is saying, in effect, there is no evidence of complaint for you to consider, either judge or judge and jury, whatever the situation happens to be. So that it's really a semantic. Uh, game we're playing here. When he says there's no complaint, there's no complaint according to the rules of the game that we play by. So you could look at it that way. I don't think it's an unethical position that he's taking. Uh, it may well be that he's uh, glossing over it very quickly, but nevertheless, if there's no evidence, there is no complaint. All right. In other words, you disagree with Mr. Poole. You think that the address is all right, and you think the objection is improper. I, I would think so. All right. Now let's go on just a little bit further. And I think all of us can agree that having regard to the facts here, there is no uniformity amongst the judges in the province of Ontario as to whether this evidence would have gone in. I think I can say with some little experience in these matters that the, some judges let it in, others would exclude it, and an awful lot would be on the line. So let's not talk about that doctrine of, as far as what the judge did was right or wrong. The fact is he ruled it out here. Now, this is what I like to discuss with the panel. If the complaint's evidence that she did complain is evidence of consistent conduct and therefore admissible, does it follow that non-complaint is evidence of inconsistent conduct? Non-complaint, yes. Then if counsel intend to show inconsistent conduct, must not the court allow in any evidence referable to the fact of complaint? 
or non-complaint or evidence in between so the jury may know all the facts. Because here we have a situation where we know the girl did complain next day. We do know that some judges would let it in. Now, how do we handle that situation? Because it seems to me, and again, I'm trying to provoke my panel to discuss this, that by excluding evidence of complaint as not being made at the first reasonable opportunity, is the judge ruling on a factual situation which enables defense counsel to submit the fact of non-complaint to the jury when in truth, if the jury knew the true story, they may think nothing of it. Is this fair? Because many, many girls are so embarrassed they don't complain about it until one, two, or three days later. Now, is it fair that the judge should allow that to happen? Can I respond in yes. part to your uh, uh, very important question? And the first is that, and I like to get this off my chest for women's lib, uh, I feel that, <laughs> Uh, and it's a purely personal, I do have some support from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who agrees that this whole business about recent complaint in sexual cases is an anachronism. It's, it's really setting up a double standard. If you go back historically with Bill Poole's example about the hue and cry, part of the historic, historical reason for this evidence of recent complaint is that uh, we men feel that women may fabricate with respect to this uh, whole sexual area. And uh, this is discussed in some of the cases. I don't see why women should be treated any differently from men uh, in this particular area. I don't think that the whole issue of recent complaint, that whole complex of uh, evidence and rules that we've built up should apply to the sexual offenses. Uh, that's the first point. Professor Soap is just stopping you there. Do you realize that under our code, a sexual assault of one male against the other does not require corroboration, but a male on a female Section 30, 134 comes into operation and corroboration is required. Well, what would you say to your well, women? As, live a, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, there is a New Zealand case, McNamara, Rex and McNamara, where you d did have two males involved with an indecent assault. And the New, New Zealand court, even way back in 1917, uh, just to show you how advanced they are, they said this uh, whole evidence of recent complaint is applicable to the uh, uh, male-male situation and isn't uh, restricted to the female-male uh, uh, situation at all. And in fact, they even suggest further. They say, if we're going to use this whole business about recent complaint, it shouldn't only apply to the sexual offense. It should apply to everything. It should apply to accidents, uh, any type of evidence that you're going to introduce. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, we restrict it too harshly with respect to the whole question of uh, the female and uh, uh, we, ha we have to do some ameliorating. Well, here. Professor, aren't we also in this situation that this doctrine of prompt complaint is and has been extended to matters of robbery, assault in the past. You'll find them all collected in Wigmore. And there's a delightful article in 1967, 9 Criminal Law Quarterly, 286 by D. E. Greenfield, who suggests that this should be extended to all crimes in view of the British Columbia decision of Re Regina versus Hurst. As a matter of common sense, when you call an issue, the question of consistent conduct, why shouldn't you be able to put it in? Now, well, what do you think of the, what the judge should tell the jury in this case? Now, first of all, you think they're wrong. What should the judge do on that objection, Mr. Bull? Are you, are you, uh, are you assuming that counsel for the Crown has uh, so risen the, and objected? Your just, just like he did in the play. I, play. Think, I think what the, what the judge should do is uh, he should explain to the jury that they must consider the facts of the case related only to the evidence that they've heard and uh, that there was no evidence of a complaint and he should instruct them on what that means. Oh, but doesn't he, if he does that, drive it right home that there was no evidence of a complaint when in truth there was. No, no. But he found no, it inadmissible. No, no, just a moment. Uh, there you see you're falling into the trap that, uh... <laughs> that's, the tr that's the trouble being a judge. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for your answer. There was a... <laughs> there was a complaint, but there's no evidence of it. All right, should he tell the jury that? No, he shouldn't tell them. He should not tell the jury that there is a complaint. He should tell them 
that as far as you're concerned in your deliberations, you must take it that there's no evidence of a complaint. Which means there was no complaint. Well, I don't agree with you. Oh, Lord. Anyway, <laughs> aren't you really now encountering a situation by the judge's ruling that you reinforce what that counsel has just said? Because they're going to be sitting there, and all of a sudden they're startled by the crown getting on its feet, taking the objection, the judge listens in the presence of the jury and says, gentlemen of the jury, there's no evidence of a complaint. Go on, Mr. Carter. Now, aren't you driving at home a fact that's not true? This is what worries me. You don't need to answer that. Well, I will answer it. <laughs> I, I will answer it because I, uh, I have some distinction on this panel, which is different from your own. I am the only lawyer in Ontario who's lost a rape case when there was no complaint of any kind. <laughs> do you agree that the judge can't tell the jury there was a complaint, but he ruled it inadmissible? He said, he can't do that, can he? Now, should he direct a new trial on your theory that there was an improper remark? It'd be too late to do that. Yeah, no, it hasn't gone to the jury yet. It hasn't gone to the jury? No. You can direct a new trial up until any time, as I see it, and my learned brothers here will correct me if I'm wrong, until it is delivered to the jury. I think he should, but he wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and you, of course... What, what he would say is, well, it's not irrevocable, and we'll fix it up, and we have to... <laughs> Then he'd end up by looking down at the council and he'd say, now you have confidence that I'll be able to correct this with the jury. <laughs> Haven't you? <clears throat> and then if that didn't work, he'd say, do you think that the county of Middlesex can really afford to bring this jury back? <laughs> Having gone through that many times as I detect from the way you approach it, do you think it does a damn bit of good? What do you really think now? For a judge trying to correct such a thing like that in his statement to the I jury later on. What advice would I give the judge? Yeah. <laughs> I can only reply to that in the words of Malcolm Cowley, who was a critic at a theatrical performance in New York. And in about the first half of the first act, the author came down to him and said, Mr. Cowley, what do you think of it? And his reply, and I adopted as my own, was, Take to the hills, he muttered hoarsely. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let's, let's for a moment... <laughs> for a moment, let's talk about another aspect. How can these situations be avoided? And I throw this out to you. <laughs> that while the voir dire is going on as to whether or not this complaint shall be admitted, should not the judge say to counsel, now, I'm considering ruling out this evidence, but are you going to say to the jury later on that there was no complaint, well knowing the fact that the next day she did complain? Because if so, I may consider letting in all the evidence for the jury to decide. And counsel very often will say, no, I'm not going to use it. That stops it. If counsel says, I am going to use it, then the judge is able to say, is he not? Well, then under those circumstances, Perhaps the entire situation shall go in as a matter of weight. And you will instruct the jury on the question of recent conduct and what it means in consistent conduct, recent complaint. But the jury then can appraise it. Now, what do you think of that technique of avoiding this very situation? Well, I can't see how he could do that. I mean, uh, with respect to the question of weight, once uh, he's ruled that uh, it can't go in... And no, but well, before he is ruled... While the dialogue is going on between counsel, Crown wants it in, defense wants it out. And he says to defense counsel, now if I rule this out, are you going to go to the jury and say there's been no complaint when in fact we know that the next day there was? And the counsel say no, then that's the end of the problem, isn't it? Because you, he won't uh, disagree. He'll always follow that, I would think. What do you think of that as a way of avoiding these situations? Where are you going to have this dialogue? Right in the courtroom during the voir dire. Well, I don't think the judge is, uh, I think the judge is uh, making a deal. <laughs> he says, if you agree to this, I'll do something else. Quite improper. Quite improper. <laughs> well then, 
don't you then really support this conclusion as a matter of logic rather than law, that as far as these complaints are concerned, if they're going to be used to show that there was no complaint when in fact there was, shouldn't the judge approach these things widely and then allow in as much evidence that's reasonably irreparable of the complaint, even though it was three or four days later? Because then you see the personality of the individual. The girl may be afraid to complain to her father and mother. She may have excellent explanations for it, which the judge somehow or other felt that he shouldn't accept and said it was not at the first reasonable opportunity. Well, I think but aren't we now then in the situation of the jury being able to appraise the thing, and they may think nothing of it once they hear it? I think what you're saying is, uh, is extremely logical. I think that, uh, and I think that the courts in our country are becoming more liberal in the acceptance of evidence, and I think they should be. Uh, I think that the, the, the basic rule that a judge or a court uh, should base admissibility on is uh, they should ask themselves this question, is the evidence relevant? Then if the answer to that is yes, they should bend every effort to let it in so that the whole truth can come out. And to answer your question in a nutshell, if I may, I think uh, that you've hit on the solution. Don't be too strict in the old rules about whether it's recent complaint or not. Let it come in, and then the jury will have something. You'd eliminate this problem in the first videotape. Then the jury can assess it as to wait I think this is safer, and I think it's more efficient than basing it on technical rules on which no real principle in law can be devised because the question of whether it's recent or not has to depend on each individual case. Thank you. Now, just one last question. We'll go to the next one. As an experienced trial counsel, what is the obligation of counsel to get up and interrupt during the other counsel's address to the jury, and do you feel it should be done? It's just a matter of practical tactics. Do you? Well, I think that it's a, I think it's a, a question that uh, might well be taught in our law schools, and I think that we as a bar, to some extent, are lacking in it. It's a question of style. It's not whether you object, it's how you object. And uh, I think if you're going to call yourself a barrister, you owe it to the public and you owe it to the courts to conduct yourself with dignity and with style. Now, in the famous Barrett case, and the case in which Sir Edward Clark made his name, he objected all the time. You'd think he was an Irish ruffian, the way he conducted himself in court but it did him a lot of good with the newspapers and it boosted up his practice. I don't agree with that. I think you should get up and complain here because you have no alternative. But I think that a more stylish way of doing it, if I'm not being stuffy, is to wait until the end of the dress and complain and ask the judge to correct it if he can in his address. That's the way I think it should be conducted. Thank you. The danger which is a, a, a subject matter of the rules here is that the girl will lend credibility to her story by repeating it to a number of people and then have them come in and repeat it to the court. Now, this is not a, a, a danger that's fully recognized in the cases, I think, but I think if you think of your own experience, a story does lend, uh, gain credibility by being repeated. That is, if you have five people come in and swear the story, it sounds truer than if only one person swore it. So generally speaking, there is a rule against self-serving evidence. In the ordinary case, either criminal or civil, the party is not allowed to manufacture evidence, if you like, by going out and telling the story to various people after the event and then calling those people to court to say, he told me then exactly the same story as he's telling me now. So the complaint in sexual case uh, uh, raises the problem of self-serving evidence. 
and the law is clear that the complaints in sexual cases subject to certain conditions form an exception to the rule excluding self-serving evidence. Now, the, the, the on point to note here is that she must be called. She can't stay out of the witness box and send her mother. Very frequently, I think she'd prefer to, uh, as one who would be more likely to be on the defense than the prosecution side, I think the rule is quite uh, very fair that demands her presence there and doesn't allow her story to be told at second hand. Now, those, I think, sir, are the general framework. Thank you. Perhaps I can turn to Frank Weatherston then and say, Frank, what do you think Carter did here that was wrong, if it was, and uh, are you of the opinion that he should have handled it in any other way? I think he's quite wrong. I don't think counsel is, is, is to be permitted to state a fact that is not true. Uh, he, he ought not to assert the truth of any fact that has not been proved in evidence. I think it's much worse and clearly wrong to assert the truth of some fact that he knows is to the contrary. In this case, he said, although the script is a little wrong, he said she didn't complain at all. And that is, is pertinently untrue. Uh, that's not to say he couldn't have made the point in the same, uh, the, the same point in a different way. I think it would have been perfectly leg legitimate for him to say, one would think that if this was really a rape, that she would have complained to the first person that she met. And have you heard any evidence to that effect? He would make the point legitimately enough that way, but certainly he can't say she didn't make a complaint at all, when in fact that she did make a complaint which was not admissible on evidence. Thank you. Now, we're, we're in the situation in this trial where it's already happened, and I think the next question to which we have to direct our minds is, what do you do now? Now, it's just to at least begin the discussion, it, it seems to me that there are perhaps three solutions, uh, perhaps not solutions, but three approaches that can be taken, and I suppose the first thing that could be done would be nothing. Just let it go and hope for the best, that the damage isn't too great. Secondly, Perhaps the matter could be cured in the trial judge's charge to the jury. But perhaps the problem there is, what does he then say? Does he run the risk of, of taking a bad situation and making it worse? Is he going to say that, well, uh, uh, there, there may well be evidence of, of complaints, and, uh, but it wouldn't be admissible if there were. So you shouldn't construe this uh, trial as meaning there have been no complaints at all. Does he get into that area of discussion? <coughs> Thirdly, could the situation ever be so bad as to allow, the, in effect, the trial to be reopened? It, it hasn't finished. We're just in the course of, of addressing the jury. And I have this, I have this in mind. Consistent statements are, are admissible on other grounds. A consistent statement is admissible by the complainant in a rape case if it's uh, recent and so on, as Professor Morton has, has indicated. But there's another line of cases which says that if a, if, a, if a person is attacked on the grounds that the story he or she tells is a recent fabrication, then consistent statements are admissible to show that it wasn't a recent fabrication. And that concept is perhaps a little larger than the recent complaint in a rape case in that it doesn't call for the promptness that a recent complaint in a rape case does. So could a trial judge then say to Carter, you have now raised the issue or made the suggestion that this girl has recently contrived this whole thing. Now, I'm going to let the Crown prove the complaint. You, you, you've created this issue. We now have to have an answer. Let's stop right here. We'll call this girl back and hear what she has to say in the presence of the jury. Now, Professor Martin, what do you, what do you think about any of those solutions or any other one that comes to mind? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I don't think it was proper for the counsel for the crime to jump up and interrupt Carter like that. I, I, that may be just bad manners. I, I, I don't know. I, I would put it 
stronger than that. I, I don't approve of counsel interrupting other counsel when they're addressing a, a jury at all. Um, I think the uh, uh, average High Court judge in Ontario could probably make the point to Carter very quickly without words being exchanged at all that Carter had gone too far at that point and Carter had better sort it out. All right, Frank, what do you think you might do, <coughs> bearing in mind that you'll probably have to start doing something? Well, uh, I, let's, uh, <laughs> let's first of all say I, I would not reopen the trial, as you suggested. I don't think that's uh, proper or necessary here. As far as the Crown counts for interrupting, of course that's wrong. But on the other hand, if the offense is serious, uh, who's to blame? And well, I think it's the right thing to do, and I would do it if I had a Crown attorney in this situation. Um, I think uh, what uh, Desmond has suggested is right, is that the uh, judge should interrupt himself and say, Mr. Carter, what you say is not right. No, I expect you to straighten that matter out. And if you didn't do it, you'd straighten it out in charge. All right, thank you. Just before we leave this, and it seems that everyone seems to recoil at the idea of, of reopening the matter, but let me, and, and I, I'm not sure at all what one would do, but let me just make the observation in passing that there have been cases that go this far, not, not modern cases, but old cases where while the jury was still considering their verdict, they asked a question, came back in and said, we don't know what to do, we'd like to hear about this point. And on his own motion, the trial judge called a witness to answer that specific point, put the witness in the box and said, what about this, dismissed him, and the jury then retired. So the, the concept about doing something that late, I suggest, isn't of itself uh, all that bad. Now, whether it applies here, I, as I say, I don't know. 